The ghost light, a single bulb left center stage after each performance, has traditionally served as a supernatural offering to those who came before us and those we have lost, to ensure that the theater, their theater, never goes dark. That the magic of theater continues. Theaters from Broadway to the West End, Los Angeles to Savannah may be closed for now, but their ghost lights remain lit. Our spirits remain hungry, our responsibilities clear. We look at this as an opportunity, a chance to build on the work we've done. A chance to embrace our theatrical roots and create new adventures. What we do now paves the way for the years to come, for the Savannah rep of the future. We promise that the ghost light will burn brightly until it is safe to begin again. It is our responsibility to carry on the traditions that precede us. We are Savannah Rep. A home for great stories and great theater. The hands of the clock will move again. And this is not the end of the story. It's a new beginning. 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 And we'll see you soon. Friday, 5 p.m. You're here. You're watching it. Episode 5 at 5 p.m. If I'd planned ahead, that would have probably been a really cool thing I could have put on a text thing or something. But instead, all I have, it's my name. Hi. Ryan McCurdy here from Savannah Repertory Theater, checking in with you again on a beautiful Friday afternoon at 5 p.m. I, uh, we were discussing in the green room the fact that I just have to own up to this, that um, I have done my hair, as, uh, as I always do for on stage off. But um, uh, we just got off bikes on our, because uh, that's how everyone gets around New York now. Just got off bikes. My brand new, wonderful helmet has left what looks like a concentrated sunburn on my forehead. We're so happy to be with you. Also, for those of you keeping track, I see Chris Bass is keeping track. Chris Bass points out shirt watching. Yes, that's correct. Every Friday at five, I do my hair, which doesn't really happen any other time during the week during quarantine. And I wear this shirt to answer the multiple questions you've just asked out loud in your homes. Yes, I own more than one shirt. Yes, this shirt gets washed. No, this is the only shirt that I wear when I'm on a Zoom or a StreamYard call. Chris Bass says, yay shirt, that's great, because frankly, it seems a little disgusting, but it does get washed. And I think that's the message I want everyone to leave with today. I don't know what it means, but it does. SavannahRep.org slash ghostlight. Uh, we had a really wonderful August. Uh, we had an incredible fundraising month. Uh, 100 and, I think 117 uh, individual patrons have uh, donated engraved pavers to mark the way from our parking lot to our new front entrance. We're so grateful for all of our patrons. Uh, we, we thought we were going to be entering what was going to be a quiet month for the Ghostlight campaign. And lo and behold, a very kind, generous, anonymous donor has uh, matched up to $500 for both September and October. So the link below is still active. We're matching up to $500 for September and October. And I think we're at $150 for September. These are things I should look up before the show. But I'm too excited to welcome my first guest. Please welcome to the show the, let's just say extraordinary because it's true. Everyone, this is Mary Chifo. Hey, Hi. yay. Oh my gosh, what an intro. The music, your words, I'm, I'm, I'm blushing all over. Oh, well, thank you. I, there's something about the font. It was one of those things, like I was going through the video editor, and when I got to that font, I was just like, stop. Like, that's the one yeah. to write all these wonderful people's names in. Um, the music, is, I, the music is, is bombastic, just like this show is not. So I feel like <laughs> there's a nice... This is a, this is a conversation show, not a, like, Bob Woodruff hard-hitting question show but made me feel epic i i got jazz i was like all right here we go going in but. you are epic mary how are you 
I'm doing pretty well. It's uh, it's Friday. That's nice. I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, and I'm such a big theater person that anytime I get to talk about anything in that proximity, I'm pretty, pretty jazzed. So yes, I, I actually and I did ask you here to talk about theater, theater, nothing but theater. I, I know. I know that some people know you from television, yes. as, as you have made an impact on, on a show that many people are very fond of. We're not going to talk about it because I feel like I when I Googled when I Googled to do some background, I found you talking about this show for what is literally looks like hours and hours of color commentary. <laughs> so we're not going to talk about your show, but we are going to set the background of our conversation to something that should make you feel at home. Excellent. Great. I also, I should have. It looks like those feet are coming out of us, which oh my god! I hadn't, I hadn't planned, but well done. It was it was meant to be. We were meant to be on this bridge, and then we've got little Saru right in between us. I don't know if that's the that's right. That's right. It's like that's uh, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the epic Doug Jones. Yes. 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 I keep pointing the wrong way. Yes. It's like Apparently. yeah. Oh, trust me. Trust yeah. me. It gets <laughs> Doug. Doug's there, over here. There's Doug. I oh, feel okay. like I almost had it. There. No. There you go. I feel like I feel like when they were putting. I love I love I love all the tracks. I'm just a track guy. But um, I feel like when they were putting the cast for Discovery together, they were like, "What are who is the most eclectic, absurd collection of performers that will delight Ryan particularly?" <laughs> they're like they're like you know what? Let's get Doug Jones. Yeah. But and we could stop there because yeah. Ryan would have been thrilled. But then let's also get Anthony Rapp. Yep. Let's get Mary Chifo. Let's get yeah. let's get the room. Um. Yeah. So I don't want to talk about this show at all. It's just gonna okay. be a backdrop. Um. You went to Juilliard. I did. Indeed, I did. Tell me, uh, I am really curious to know uh, at what moment in your sort of upbringing that became a spark. And then also f uh, for those, uh, we, we have uh, people watching who are in their teens or thinking about what they want to do either for their undergraduate or their graduate. Mm -hmm. What was the, what connected you to it and how did you, how did you end up there? Cool. It's a it's a fun story because, and I know we're going to talk more about my family, who I'm uh, very a, fond of. Yes, <laughs> as am I. We're a little trio. I'm an only child. It's lots of good stuff. But they are both. Both of my parents are actors, and my dad, in fact, um, I uh, he went to Juilliard. Uh, he I am the first legacy in the drama division. In fact, um, I was in. They do in the drama division. We do group numbers starting with one. Um, and he was in group six and I was in group 44. And uh, so that is in answer to your question about how I was introduced to the school initially. It was something that I would hear the term occasionally. It wasn't something, you know, there's a, obviously the school has had many different reputations throughout the years. My dad was definitely someone who he came in straight out of um, high school, 17, skinny kid from Long Island. Um, and he says that he was a little too young and naive to really be traumatized. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, but it was something that I had been aware of. Um, and then when I, uh, I, as I said, big theater person, you know, pretty much uh, from the beginning, but really got into it in middle school. I got into a musical theater program, uh, Millican Middle School, a great public um, middle school right near my house. And um, then high school, I had an amazing drama teacher, Josh Adele. Um, and 10th grade, uh, we took a trip to New York because uh, my dad grew up there. My mom moved there um, from North Carolina um, at 19. And um, we were in the area. We were on the Upper West Side, I guess. And my dad was like, do you want to check out the school or do you want to see? And uh, Kathy Hood, their administrative director, who is the loveliest, um, gave us a personal tour. She was around. My dad emailed you know, through the alumni, he had that um, address. And I was, <laughs> and still am, a very rigorous student. And uh, 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 <laughs> yes, uh, I'll, I'll end with that. But I came in being like, so I literally said, like, how is the academic rigor here? <laughs> And Kathy, bless her, was like, well, you know, we we have I was going to it was going to be a BFA for me right. coming out of high school. So she said you would have a liberal arts class every semester. Um, but we find that the rigor in the classroom um, outside of the academic classes are, are just as intense. And she was not wrong. Um, but it really actually was great timing because in 10th grade, like I said, I was taking all of these honors, APs, all that stuff and doing theater. And it really reset my mentality on 
what I was doing in class and how it was applying to making me a full human being um, and an artist. And um, so I'm grateful for that, regardless of whether I ended up going to the school. Uh, but then as, you know, 11th grade, you know, starting to really look and apply, I really started to feel that a conservatory program was what I wanted. Um, because for me, it was that transfer of all the rigor that I had in all my classes, but in a concentrated medium that I knew I really wanted to be a part of for the rest of my life. And um, of course, I got very nervous <laughs> before the actual auditions. And uh, I applied to a few other North Carolina School of the Arts was another was my other top choice. I really liked their program. And uh, than a, a few other uh, schools, but I knew that Juilliard, I did another tour later on. I felt it in my gut, like walking in the halls, there was something that felt akin to me. And while yes, my dad had gone there, it felt very specific to who I was and how I was developing as an artist. And then, you know, audition, they have a very thorough audition process. They used to have a cut system that they don't have anymore. So now it's just, um, you have an initial audition, a callback that day, then a final callback weekend actually at the school for at, when I did it, I, I think it was two and a half days. Now I think it might be three or four days. Mm. Um, of course, everything is not the same at this exact moment That's in right. time. I'm, I don't know what they're going to do next year, but um, I, you know, I made it through that process um, and kind of walked away from that weekend feeling like, well, no matter what, I feel like I learned a lot and this was incredible. Um, and then it ended up being the right fit. And something my drama teacher, uh, thinking of all the students who are looking at schools right now, something he said to me that helped me so much, because literally we finished a rehearsal for the musical, The Boyfriend, uh, if you're aware. You, the, the, like, Julie, the Julie Andrews? Like yeah, the, yeah, like yeah. Sur, la, sur la plage? Yeah, yeah, yes! Okay. Yes. And that, I was that's course, buried somewhere deep in there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was Madame Dubonnet, the headmistress, of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, I haven't pulled that accent in a while, but um, but after one of those rehearsals, I remember going to my teacher and being like, Mr. Duff, can we talk about auditions? And he sat me down and something that I've taken with me for every audition since, but particularly with schools was they're auditioning for you too. Yeah. And uh, I kind of came in maybe a little bit too much on, the, okay, what do you got to show me? But of course uh, they ended up showing me that they were the program that I wanted to be in and thrive in. Um, but yeah, and then uh, the rest is history in many ways, but I definitely found that I'm a very physical, vocal actor, like that kind of all encompassing training was something I really craved. And that's mm -hmm. something that is one of their strongest suits is it's about the full body. Um, I'm very cerebral, so I need to work on everything else. <laughs> Right, right, <laughs> like right. get, get out of that so I can be present in that. And uh, I really found that to be true. I think I think you and I had similar experiences working through that, because I think in college I had a very I, I a lot te multiple teachers who had not spoken to each other to confirm this opinion to me. were like, you know, you're having all the right thoughts, but the <laughs> vessel is flawed. Yeah, like a lot. I had I had I've had multiple directors of the years while yeah. I was in my in my bachelor program where you know they're, they're like we just like what what you're thinking is great and how you're saying it is great but it's like you're sitting on top of of, of a constantly shifting plate um so yeah oh. i and conservatory conservatory i went to a full liberal arts school mm -hmm. instead of a conservatory and i it's interesting to see the um sort of the, the pros and cons of both yeah it, i i would define conservatory sort of the way that you're saying this idea that you you are surrounded by you're surrounded by the craft and that there's there's sort of an all immersive is that how you would also to find sort of the difference between the conservatory programs and? Yeah, I mean, certainly from, yeah, talking to peers who did go more in that direction. Yeah, a phrase I ended up using too was, uh, what did I say, theater went from being my escape to my constant reality. Um, and I really, yeah, and as a consequence, I had to come to terms with who I was as a person, which is not the reason I signed up, but I, it ultimately is. But <laughs> uh, heaven, I mean, heaven forbid we feel if heaven forbid we're confronted with who we actually are. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh, I have to work on myself, too. Yeah. Ah! But but I'm very grateful that that was the case. But yeah, I mean, and I really do have the mentality with looking at programs in general um, is that we ultimately find the program that's right for us in the mm -hmm. moment. And our at Juilliard, it's a mixture of MFA, BFA. And I really found and everyone in between, like you, there's no prerequisite other than high school um, and and acting, I guess. <laughs> but um, but uh, 
our class was such a mixture and as someone who's never really felt like directly in my age like i've always felt like it was such a gift because i was like right we're all here at the moment that we need to be here right, right, right. and this is the right group of people and like yes there are moments where certain illusions happen and someone's like i didn't see that movie or whatever but other than that it became so much about who's present who's here who's right for this role who's stretching themselves um so i always say that too to anyone looking at schools that it is you know, there's not one place to go that will make you the ultimate actor. Like everyone's craft is so unique and different. Like, thank goodness we all don't go to the same program. Mm -hmm. um, I also, I love that you went, I love that you were a legacy, which I think is great. And it's still, it, my research turns up that you were both the first and to this point are still the only, I, as I, I understand it, yeah. I believe so. There, I, I think so, but I don't right. want to well, <laughs> the headline. No, Chief Oak claims, but as, I believe so. As far as I, no one called me to tell me I'd been bumped. <laughs> incompetent talk show host claims <laughs> Mary Chifo politely agrees. <laughs> Internet explodes. I think that's the new. Um, so we're going we're gonna to show a picture of your family. Yeah, okay. um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it up over our faces. There, there you all are. Um, I'm going to take the, I'm taking your name off just for a second so we can yeah. see everyone's names. Um, I found this because I was doing a little background on you because obviously I'm obsessed with you as a theater person and, and, and a <laughs> television actor, but I did not know you played your mom's daughter. Your, I, you, yeah. or rather, you played your, your mom's younger self yes. in that film. Yes. So you were young Beth in the film that we just showed. Yes. You also are, your first acting role was at, at a very young age. I remember seeing this film and you were either two or three in your first film appearance. Yes, I, I think three, yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, again, that was, that was a role in which your mom was already in the film and you ended up on set and have, you know, been immortalized on celluloid. I don't have a picture yeah. of that, although I looked very hard for it. Yeah, no, I don't know if we've been able to find a picture, but yeah, this, uh, Sandra Bullock's making sandwiches. Um, and yeah, and it was actually me and um, my grandma, Libba, my mom's mom, Love it. we were both there on set. And the joke was I became sleeping girl because I got tired and I fell asleep like it was in a restaurant and then my grandma on the other hand was like very much like oh am I in the shot uh so it was a very uh very fun very sweet on brand moment but yes that was my debut into all of it and uh, and you never looked back <laughs> never looked back <laughs> now the one of one of the ways in which uh the way in which we got to know each other is in developing new works that uh developing new works that are both for uh one of your own if i may be fair one mm -hmm. that you're working on with with your mom uh works for theater stage uh, for stage for film for television uh i've seen you work through a lot of different uh genres with what seems like relative ease i've seen you move through different character types you've played across gender you've played across uh, across uh, uh, worldview very easily I, I know obviously your training speaks for itself but did you having the family that you did did you get to juilliard with a an expectation did you know did you know the greats did you know the playwrights you wanted to know did you have a, a big existing library or did they mm. sort of put all of that theater and confidence in you mm. Great question. I, I'm trying. Every, every episode yeah. gets a little better. Yeah. And I have to say that that's been something that I've been so grateful for um, in our in our readings is that I've been able to play so many things. And that's always been my inclination. Like I said, partly my good student, but also I think my very intense imagination. I The genres I love to watch the most are fantasy, sci-fi, um, which again, the circumstances of getting to be on track is, you know, tenfold uh, a thrilling experience. But um, I've always defined myself as a transformative actor and much in part to the fact that my two greatest inspirations are my parents who are that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, did, have either of them worked? Obviously, Laurel is, is, is buried under that very sort of <laughs> iconic form of, of prosthetic work. Yeah. Um, did either of them, have either of them done a character work with that much prosthetics or did you basically come out and say, you, you're, you're both character actors, let me Ron Perlman myself. Like yeah, what was yeah, the... Yeah. <laughs> had they had they had, had they ever had they ever done that much not, latex? Not that much. Okay. My my mom had done on Angel. She played Ghost Mom, <laughs> and had a lot of. She's definitely done Ghost a lot mom. of intense um, like age makeup for um, uh, why I can't think of the, um, Richard Kelly's um, not oh, Southland Tales, not Donnie Arco. She also had a, a lot of heavy age makeup. She is not a, a fan <laughs> of wearing it. She respects it. She does not care for it. Um, my dad also in the Hulk movie, like the 
early on that I don't even know if it saw the light of day. He played the scientist that makes the like first experiment and gets all expanded. Um, so I and there's a I got traumatized both times with my mama's ghost mom and visiting set and not liking it. Also, this is a, a bit of a tangent anecdote, but I'm also a big Star Wars fan. But I couldn't watch those original films for a while because I also have this with ET. Some of those early prosthetics made me queasy, like looking at them. Mm -hmm, there was something mm -hmm. about the way the light wasn't refracted, I think, that registered strange for me. Anyway, the tables have turned. Um, but to your question about just like transformation in general and part of, again, why I lean so much towards uh, Juilliard when I was looking at programs was they have a deep respect for the character actor, for the transformative actor. And they really push their students to go in that direction. And if you look at a lot of the alum, you know, whether they're someone that is very prevalent in our consciousness right now, or just it's, it, you go see a program and you're like, oh, that person went there. Oftentimes it's someone who really enjoys going to that to that place and you know it's not limited to the school but i found definitely within my classmates um it was a group of people that wanted to really embrace how much we can be someone else um and i that was always my inclination like i always loved whether it be partly you know i I am, you know, six feet tall and have angular features. And, you know, I got cast as the Baroness instead of Maria in Sound of Music. And, that, and you know, luckily I had Wicked to inspire me and make me realize that I could be all that I am and be the protagonist. But I was playing a lot of older women. I played a lot of men, um, both in high school and then um, at Juilliard, a lot of Shakespeare men, which was an incredible gift and experience. Um, but I feel, yes, overall my journey when I look from like, you know, I played Moses in my third grade Child of the Nile play. Like the universe has continued to encourage me to push boundaries, to not be limited by what society deems as appropriate, whether it be because of my height or my gender or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm just really grateful that that has been the perpetual theme. And with Laurel, I mean, it did all culminate so beautifully coming out of school to have the opportunity to not only do language, movement work, uh, play a character that lives so much in the gray, both in her storyline and in her femininity and masculinity, um, and who doesn't ascribe to our, certainly our human norms of, of beauty. I find her a very beautiful Klingon, but you know, there's a lot there in, um, I am empowered by that. I think some, I think, I hope we're moving past this, particularly observe this in some women, that it's the fear of, oh no, I'm not gonna look pretty in this self tape or like right. that society won't deem me appropriate because of the way I look, I don't fit a certain thing. And I think, I'm, I feel like I'm seeing more. I think there's a lot more <laughs> to go and more, mm -hmm. more to come, but I hope that we're moving more towards that. And um, I certainly know a wealth of, of wonderful um, female uh, character actors who should be just as much a pr uh, protagonist as the next person. That I think that's part of the recalibration that we're having right now is, yes, let's not say that if you're a certain type of actor, you're only going to be this part of the plot. What happens when we shift the focus over to this person? So I hope to champion that. <laughs> I'm glad that it's you because I, I, I feel like I feel like you have. You've you've got the you've, the charisma and the voice that we 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 will hear that coming from. So when you are the champion of that, I think we're all going to line up behind you on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mary, I love talking to you. I I'm going to let you go because um, I I could just literally sit here and talk to you all afternoon, and that is not what I told people the show was going to be. Okay. <laughs> um, towards the end of the show, I'm going to bring up some information on the screen about your show Heartbeats. Yes. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, learning more about that, hearing about that. Thank you so much for coming on and being thank with you. us. Thank you. Mary, uh, I will see you soon. I'll see you next week on our Zoom. So yeah, actually, yeah. I'll see you. I'll see you on Sunday. I'll see you on yeah, Sunday. Sunday. But yeah, thank you so much, and thank you everyone for watching. Thanks, Mary Chifo, everybody. Mary is an actor currently seen on Star Trek Discovery and is the first and only legacy student at Juilliard of the Performing Arts Department. If I'm wrong, come after me, not Mary Chifo. We'll be right back after this quick message with Rachel Chafkin. Just checking the traffic. <laughs> cookie Crook, this scheme to get Cookie Crisp isn't taking off. Who can blame me? It looks like little chocolate chip cookies. But Cookie Crisp cereal stays crispy in milk. And it's part of this complete breakfast. 
Well, Cookie Crook, it's time you started a new career. Yeah, this one's definitely winding down. If you like cookies, you'll love Cookie Crisp. If you like cookies, you'll like Cookie Crisp. I have no idea what that means to bring in our next guest, but I'm so excited about our next guest. Uh, she is an, uh, a director, a, an extraordinary creationist, and she's a collaborationist, which is a word that I'm hoping she will not tell me it's ridiculous for using to introduce her. Please welcome Rachel Chavkin to the show. Hi. Hi nice to see you, Ryan. How are you? I'm all right. Nice to see you. Um, I, I am going to point out, we were both just talking in the chat during the commercial that Mary is super inspiring every time she chats about stuff. I love listening to her talk about theater. It makes me really happy. Yeah, it was lovely to hear her talk about her experiences and um, reifying ideas of, of beauty and strength and femininity. Which actually dovetails perfectly into why I'm so uh, happy to have you on. I think a lot of people know your work uh, for your Tony Wynn and for the work of yours that has worked through the, the off-Broadway system into Broadway. But I, I am fascinated with and first became associated with you uh, because of the team, which is I think an incredible group of, mm. of performers, creators, working with uh, people like Janae Bonick and Jalen Levingston, who are just great. I would love to, uh, I've tried to ask the questions on this show that people don't ask on other shows. So when mm -hmm. did you have, when did you have the inspiration to have a company that was creating these very divergent uh, uh, collaborat collaborationist works? And, and so what is the journey that has gotten you to where you are with it? Oh, uh, I mean, I was part of a group of friends who started the team in 2004, um, which was uh, about a year and a half uh, after leaving school. And I had begun making my own work while at college. I had the great good fortune to go to NYU. And while I was there, I took a class that was taught by this mad uh, experimental choreographer named Marlene Pennison. And the class was called COW, which stood for Creating Original Work. And it happened on Sunday nights from 7 to 10 p.m. And you did not get graded for it. Um, she did not take attendance. You were encouraged to show up to class. And if you did, you were encouraged to bring cookies or some other snack. And the only assignment for the entire semester was to be interesting alone on stage for 10 minutes. And uh, she did not tell you how to do that. She did not give you exercises to help you do that. Um, she did not discuss with you what interesting meant. And you were left in the agony of your own um, void, basically. And what she was interested in, I realized many years in retrospect, um, was to see you forge a process for making for yourself. And it was by far and away the greatest class I ever took. Um, and, uh, and she sat with you, I would say like a doula uh, in that agony. Um, and basically the way that I began kind of giving myself I began giving myself assignments and prompts, and that is still how the team works today. And so I began working in that in that method with a group of actors while I was at school. I made a, a an adaptation of um, Allen Ginsberg's Howl, um, and uh, and just kept going. And eventually, that became the team. Uh, and uh, the team has gone through radical reformation multiple times. And I would say um, since uh, we made a work called Primer for a Failed Superpower in 2017, that radically cracked open the company uh, and, our, and our sense of membership mm -hmm. uh, and moving actually away from thinking about ourselves in that way because it felt very closed and also perpetuated systems of white supremacy that mm -hmm. we uh, had no interest in continuing to participate in. And so now are in this moment of making a new piece called Reconstruction um, that is an incredible group of, I think over 20 artist, writer, collaborator, performers. And I, I've, I continue to find the team um, endlessly compelling in part because of the democracy that's mm -hmm. in the room. And so we, yeah, we make everything through this collaborative writing process. Which is, is beautiful. And I think um, it, it, it's a type of work which, and actually our next guest, Kathleen, is, uh, works, is working with the civilians right now. And I know the mm -hmm. civilians, there's, there's very much, there's that, their team all called the R&D 
uh, team. It's it, there's you 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 find a lot of rooms these days are being constructed by by the producers that have raised the money or or, or uh, a group of people that want to bring in other people that aren't necessarily good for the whole group. So it's very rare to see perfect rooms. And I feel like a lot of the collaborative teams I've seen for the team productions have been what I would consider perfect rooms. And our <laughs> our director of new. I works, would object to the word perfect because it's so. Um... It's confining. so imperfect. It is. I yeah, would say yeah. they, they are That's they are certain. well they're well constructed rooms. They are very in, in, uh, intentionally very maybe intentionally constructed rooms. That is true. The yeah. um, but the work I think uh, gains from that. Our our director of new works, Michael Jacinto, uh, had had said I think two or three weeks ago that you know his whole job is just to get the room right and move you know get the room right yeah. and finish the work. Um, I know I, I don't want to hold you for too long. I know no, our, it's, our, it's I'm doing fine. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm fascinated to ask you some of the questions that I think maybe not everyone else has asked you, because part of the whole reason of having this show is that we have a really enthusiastic and robust audience in uh, Savannah that I can't wait to get back to. I'm, I'm in New York until, uh, until things, in, things in the South improve a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But um, I, they, are, they love theater. They love to know um, people's uh, trajectories. So I know that they can YouTube you and, and hear about, uh, about Hades Town and about Great Comet. I want to talk about a show called Small Mouth Sounds for a moment, if that's oh, okay. Oh, sure. Yeah. Which is a show I've been thinking about a lot lately. I, as, as have I. In fact, um, there is, I believe, oh. <laughs> I believe that's the Ars Nova cast. This is the Ars Nova company. Yeah. The original yes. off-Broadway company. Um, for someone that is, and I do have a picture I want to show because this is my favorite from the uh, off-Broadway run mm. of Hades Town. For someone that is 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 so connected with um, with uh, visuals and sort of an alters an alter director's eye for the way that that uh, tech is crafted, I was astonished when I saw Small, small Mouth Sound <laughs> about how how tiny, how precise, and how yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, i was just I was hoping you might talk a little bit to what it was what it was to come to a show that required you to do so much with so few words and, and how that kind of affected your, your, maybe your normal process or a process you would have approached another show with. Yeah. Um, well, so first for anyone watching who doesn't know, Small Mouth Sounds is by a writer named Bess Wohl, uh, extraordinary writer and um, is set on a silent meditation retreat. And so the vast majority of the show has no words. Um, uh, there's like a few moments where the rules are broken yeah. and um, uh, there's like one absolutely glorious, devastating um, monologue where uh, someone is allowed to ask the, the teacher a question um, that becomes this aria. But, uh, but otherwise, yeah, it's a wordless show that um, I have to say, I have never laughed as hard <laughs> um, as I have during a process as I as I did during Small Mouth Sounds. Uh, I mean, I I think I literally did <laughs> pee my pants multiple times, um, and uh, and and so it ended up living in this place where there was absolutely huge elements of slapstick, and then uh, and then just devastating. And I and I equally, I have never worked on a show where going into the first preview, I had as little understanding of what the audience was experiencing as I did with Small Mouth Sounds, because of course I knew all the backstories and the mm -hmm. moments to look for. And I had worked in excruciating choreographic detail with the company because we had to guide people's eyes because usually you would look to whoever is speaking. Um, but of course there were no words. So s stuff was literally like, Jess, you're gonna pop the chip bag and then you're gonna hold while you listen for Marsha to roll over and Sakina to sigh and then um, Eric, you'll cough, and then Jess, you're gonna reach in and grab the first chip. I mean, it was really mm -hmm. that choreographed so that you could get sort of all the all the all the bits. Um, and uh, and typically the way we rehearsed it, and I should say I don't have a process. Like I, I one of the great joys of the eclecticism of my career is the fact that I get to be a different director for every show I work on. Um, and so Small Mouth Sounds was definitely a continuation of that. Mm -hmm. um, 
But uh, I don't know, we would just like, I'm thinking about the very opening sequence where everyone enters the room and we would just run it like hundreds of times. You know, it began with Eric, the guy with the red handkerchief around his neck, I think in, and then the two women who are lovers who are sort of split up here because they're fighting in this moment, you know, and one by one they would enter. And like on the third or fifth time, Brad, who was the hat guy, mm -hmm, yep tripped coming in and it, and it was like you know doublingly funny uh and so then he tried to do it again the sixth through the 20th time and screwed it up and it didn't work out you know so you're like there's a lot of retrofitting back to how you know what had happened during this magical time but it meant by the time we got you know got to performance it was yeah it was ex excruciatingly detailed in its mapping did your um was there was there a did the psm have uh, have a have notes on that mapping because i know you remounted it at signature about a year after ars nova if i'm if i'm tracking because i saw both productions and obviously didn't know it well enough the second time to know, to see the complete transfer of everything. But was there a map that you put on the new performers and the, and the returning performers or did you yeah. just reinvent it? Okay. No, no, there was, I mean, to a certain extent, of course, we, there was some degree that we had to reinvent um, uh, because, because every performer is different, but we, a, a number of the original cast were able to do the commercial transfer. And then we spent, had to seek performers who had internal chemistries that related to the chemistries on which we built it because because there to a certain extent there was no there was writing mm -hmm. that was the play and there was writing that was the production and the production as a whole obviously including the play was what had done so well and so we 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 wanted to hold on to that so yeah we we sort of the way we approached that process was we basically vomited at our heroic performers, either this choreography that someone else had invented or choreography that they themselves, you know, a year and a half prior had invented and then had time once they knew it to mm -hmm. figure out their own navigation through it. And so of course then it changed and breathed and stuff, but we began from, yeah, from that. I love map. It. I, I I could think of no better way to end our brief time together than with a quote that came in, I think, across Facebook. I just love this. I'm going to show it. Inspired by your work, insight, and being Rachel from Bradley Hackers. On Thank Facebook. you, Bradley. That's super lovely. Um, Rachel, I appreciate you spending a few minutes with us. Yeah, and, pleasure. And, and uh, I'm excited. I just saw uh, Je one of Janae's videos, I think, um, a, a couple days ago. They're making the quarantine the quarantine videos as they prep for being oh, able yeah. to come back to work on the piece. I'm yeah. excited to see it and uh, whatever version it takes form in first. Um, but thanks for being with us today. And I uh, hope everything goes well and we'll see you soon. Yeah, thanks for tuning in and best of luck. Thanks, Rachel. Rachel Chavkin is a Tony-winning director, most recently of Hades Town, which uh, I will be buying a ticket for again as soon as it is back on Broadway. Um, so I have a special treat for you. Uh, not only uh, do we have an extraordinary guest lined up, who's coming on in a second, but next week on the show, you're going to hear the musical stylings and get some insight into one of uh, my favorite singer-songwriters in the world, Mr. Stephen Lyons. Uh, he has graciously agreed to pop by uh, this show instead of a commercial break because... As much as everyone seems to love these 80s ads, I think you're going to love a heartfelt song that much more. Uh, so I'd like to welcome to the show Mr. Stephen Lyons. Hey, Stephen. Hey, brother. How are you? Good. And someone was trying to FaceTime me as I'm on this show. There's a lot going on at a, at a, at a single moment here. You've got the guitar. We're going to learn a lot more about you next week. I want to whet everyone's appetite with a song right now. Do you have something you'd be willing to play for us? Absolutely. Absolutely. Stephen Lyons, everybody. And I want you for the daylight And I hear your wild song go And you show me all your wounds and scars 
So battle lines and hard fought wars, your dirty paws and the sweetness of a mad song I know too well. And so we run to the borderland, and we try our hands, and the faith turns blind. And the daylight carves a soft, pure light into your eyes on the stone. And the city burns with a will to please you Unholy alliances that seized you Grace that stripped your pride And found you scared and brave, my love And you and I are of a different kind We burned our bridges, then we changed our minds We rolled the angels, burned out wings Falling from cathedrals of forgotten things. Yeah, the struggle up the stairs to the starry skies. For the burden of a melody that keeps us alive. Daylight And you and I are of a different kind We burned our bridges, then we changed our minds We rolled with the angels that burned our wings Fallen from cathedrals of forgotten things Yeah, I know your stripes and you know my price It's a long road back for a sacred vice For the burden of a melody the keeps us alive And so we run Back to the borderland As children do Hand in hand Back to where the warbler soars As twilight Stephen Lyons, you knew which song to play for me today. <laughs> That's how we uh, stay connected. That's right. Tell, tell, tell everybody the name of that song, please, and, uh, and where people can find your music before they hear you more next week on the show. The uh, song is called The Borderland, and um, <clears throat> it's uh, a song I'm going to record uh, when I go back into the studio. And uh, it came out of a period of several years when I was um, working, um, uh, doing a temp job uh, <clears throat> in a... Uh, you know, office job, soul killing kind of environment. And um, it just in New York sometimes forces you to think about the places that that um, made you and that um, uh, that inspire you, um, you know, and uh, it's it's kind of about remembering those places and that sacredness and meeting someone who shares that uh, that kind of connection. It's really about two songwriters, really. And, yeah. and that is a connection I know a lot of people feel when they hear you play. And we're looking forward to having you for more conversation and some more music next week. 
Uh, Sounds great. <laughs> all right. That was, everybody, my dear friend, my brother, Mr. Stephen. He's over here, Mr. Stephen Lyons. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> brother. Thank you, brother. See you next week. Um, I just realized this show is an embarrassment of riches. If you've been watching any of the episodes previous, you know that this is just the continuation of really great people having really great things to say. I'm not a great. I'm not great at hosting yet, but I'm getting there. One of the things I forget is that I love listening to people tell stories, and I forget to ask them the thing that I that they that they said they wanted to talk about, and I want to talk about it. Mary Chifo is going to come back and tell us about. Heartbeats, because it's literally this month, and it's my show, and she can come back and talk if she wants. Hi, Mary. Hello. <laughs> I also I also just need to get a drink of water before we start with Kathleen. So I'd love to hear Great. what's going on. I've got the date. I've got the info, but you know it better than me. Take it away, Mary. Okay. So for everyone watching, uh, strangely, because of Star Trek, I got introduced to long-form genre improv uh, through Impro Studio in Los Feliz here in L.A., and there's a specific group named Ripley Improv, named after our icon Ripley from Alien. And um, she, uh, she, they, this amazing group of women who all have been trained in this long form improv, uh, would normally do live shows. They did uh, dystopia, young adult uh a uh, novel as a genre. They did glam in the style of glow, but with arm wrestling, which I got to guest on last year. Um, a bunch of them are a part of the improvised generation, which is in the style of next generation. Uh, the studio itself does Jane Austen, all sorts of things. So it's incredible. I highly encourage you to check that out. But <laughs> what I have become involved with as a co-producer with my dear friend, Jessica Lynn Verdi, who, um, came up with this concept is it's called Heartbeats. It is in a completely improvised medical drama uh, inspired by shows like Grey's Anatomy. Um, and uh, it will be on Twitch. Uh, we have our preview night next Friday, the 18th at 7 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. And if you go to Twitch, it's twitch.tv slash Ripley Improv. Um, <laughs> um, yes, that perfect. Look at that, guys. Write it down. Uh, Twitch can be intimidating to some people, which is why I'm glad I do get to speak to this because it's actually quite straightforward. You, you type in that link, you go right there. We encourage you to create an account. It's completely free so that you can follow and be a part of the chat, which um, be, this is the exciting thing because usually they're doing shows live on stage uh, at the studio. So for this, um, we will be doing with Zoom, they have a cast of, it's a total of, of 12 actors, but they'll do about six and six per episode, plus a guest star, Patient, which I will be in the premiere episode on the 25th. Ah. Um, and then each week there's a new patient. Uh, but the idea is that this is, and Jessica really, who is a, a big Grey's Anatomy lover, had always wanted to do this genre because she felt it catered to um, the style and particularly in Zoom, because now everyone has green screens. We've got the great stock footage of various hospital angles. Um, we actually have our tech rehearsal tonight, but we've been rehearsing for months and I've been able to come in and observe, uh, play the patient for all the trial runs. And the amazing thing is you have rehearsal, but it's, you're not actually rehearsing the same play every time. Everyone's getting to know their characters, all of the actors, the regular cast. Um, they all have predetermined characters that they've been developing and discovering with each other uh, for the past few months. And um, it's a, just an incredible group. And I'm just really thrilled to introduce the world to this type of improv more because the studio, which I'm, I'm currently taking classes there, is, is about, it's to me, it's scene study without the lines you have to memorize. It's mm -hmm. about moment to moment work. It's about living in the silence. It's about not trying to be funny every five seconds. Mm -hmm. It's about having real experiences and creating scenes. And, you know, anyone with theater training, we have all like, what you know, breaking down the scene, what's my objective and all that stuff. So you have all that training in you. And part of why I really felt like I sunk right into it um, once I started taking classes, it's all the things that are going on in my brain but you're doing it in the moment. And when you have a great ensemble like this that will really carry you through, um, it's really remarkable. And uh, I think it'll be really fun. So I really, the oh, and because it's gonna be serialized. So mm -hmm. it's something that we really hope every Friday night you tune in, you um, you know, we'll have a last week on. Uh, I'm also hosting, after I do my stint as the um, 
as the patient, I will be fully the host of the talk back, the downbeat after the show. We'll spend about 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly the reaction we want. <laughs> everyone, everyone in the green room liked that just uniformly. Everyone Excellent. enjoyed that a lot. Yes. Oh my God. Jess is going to be so happy. That was, that was her brainchild. Um, and yeah, and because I'm someone that came into this improv slightly recently, but still loves it and wants more people to get to know it in our discussions about how best to bring this to a wider audience, we thought, oh, have a talk back where we're not only talking about what happened, like whose mm -hmm. sparks are flying, like none of the ships are predetermined. We don't know who, you know, had a relationship with who or who's falling in love now, but we'll talk about that. Um, but then my goal too is within that 20 minutes to also really talk to the actors and like the experience of like, I really didn't know I was going to make that hit one of our terms, you mm -hmm. know, when you have a good plot twist where you're like, I saw you in the bathroom last night or whatever it is. <laughs> what a strange choice, Mary, but that's where my brain is. I don't know. Um, but it's a really fun way, I think, for audiences to understand uh, what a task it is to improvise an hour long show. And it's not the only thing we're gonna have is we will have Twitter help us determine uh, the patient's condition um, for the week um, through metaphor. Like we'll have it be like metaphorical questions and then from that we will choose the condition so the patient will be aware and we will have you know some level of terminology. Um, but again, focusing on the, the interpersonal mm -hmm. stuff because that's what we love. Um, and then we'll get a suggestion uh, right at the top from the chat. And that's really what we want to engage is throughout uh, the viewing, there will be moments for the audience to give an additional suggestion of theme or which characters do you want to see together next. Um, and yeah, I'm really, really excited. It feels like such a great way to expand on this particular form of improv. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm just grateful. Ripley has been such an incredible anchor for me in the past year and a half. Um, it's an incredible, incredible group of women individually and together. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to, to be able to celebrate it and support it. And I really encourage everyone to check it out there. There it is. Just type that in and also, yeah, encourage to just each in the chat and really have the full experience. Um, yeah, I'm. Uh, thanks for letting me do that. Because uh, yes, I was. I, I, well, yeah. your your improv chops are on display for the fact that that was like brilliant. <laughs> so it's twitch.tv slash Ripley Improv. The show is Heartbeats. It is a long form genre improv. You, my friend, are Mary Chifo, and you are awesome. You got all that in there. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you. And the preview night should be really fun. We're going to do a panel like where I'm gonna host and you get to know all the actors. We're gonna do some giveaways um, and uh, drop some, you know, you know, that type of stuff. Preview night, dropping like clips and things. So just to give you a flavor of what we're up to. So yeah, that's, start, that's next Friday, the 18th, 7 p.m. PT, which means 10 p.m. EST. <laughs> well, I'll have plenty of time to finish taping this show, take a shower, a nap, eat dinner, and watch your show. There you go. It'll be a perfect transition. Mary Chifo, everyone. I'll see you on Sunday, Mary. Goodbye. Thank you, Ryan. Mary Chifo of Star Trek Discovery and amazing improv skills we will all learn about as a country very shortly on the uh, two, two Fridays from now. Give me a thumbs up. Two, that, I'm trying to do the math in my head. This is the 11th, 18th, 25th. Two Fridays. I'm trying to do, she's in the green room now and you can't see her. So I'm trying to do like two words. Is that right, Mary? Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> okay, good. All right, good, good, good. So here's the thing. I am so excited. I have another guest. Most shows, like, most shows, like, you know, 20 minutes ago, people, that's enough show. No, it's not enough show because there are too many wonderful people that I want to talk to. I would like to welcome to the show a director uh, formerly of Roundabout uh, and this year, which I'm excited to talk to, of the civilians and uh, a lot of really cool work besides. Please welcome to the show, Kathleen Captasuner, everyone. Hello. Hi. I thank you for being so. Thank you for rolling with it. We we've been all chatting in the private chat, and it, basically it's me saying this has gone off the rails. Can is everyone okay to like hang out and like come back and talk about their show later? And thank you for being so patient. Thank you for being with us, Kathleen. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Um, I. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I am super excited, I, and, and I've been trying so hard not to be, I've tried not to frame anything on this show about, about, um, about COVID or about politics or about any of the things that we spend most of the rest of our days and weeks thinking and talking about. Um, I do want to talk about how you uh, joined the R&D department at, at uh, the Civilians very late last year slash into the beginning of this year. This, this was your first year with them. I was so excited to kind of find out what it what it was like moving into the COVID era, how that uh, affected your experience with them so far, what you've been able to do, what hasn't been able to happen yet. I was hoping you might be able to talk to that a little bit. Yeah. So um, how I got involved, I applied. Um, That's and- the best way to do it. <laughs> for those of you out there watching, <laughs> just sign up for stuff and be super talented and you might get. <laughs> no, but um, I was finishing my fellowship at Roundabout and I was sort of looking for the next step and I applied for a variety of different opportunities and the RNG group really stuck out to me because I'm I'm really interested in generative work, um, device work, and really having a close, collabor- a close collaboration with um, living writers. And so the R&D group just seemed like the right next step for me. Um, I applied and um, I didn't know what how it was going to work. Um, but I was paired with a writer. Um, his name is Matt Barbeau. Mm-hmm. Um, he's had a really great playwriting career um, and has a lot of great things to do. Um, but he pitched this idea um, that he wanted to develop for the year. So the way that the program works is that there are three directors and residents. Um, and then there are about, uh, I'm going to say like six writers. It's, it's, by, it's project-based. And so um, sometimes directors and writers apply together and they're both accepted. Um, And sometimes, um, most of the time what happens is like there's some matchmaking that occurs and um, the the civilians does a great job of of doing that matchmaking. So um, I was a product of that matchmaking and um, I spent a year attending the meetings. Um, That actually happened, the majority of them happened um, pre-COVID. And so I was able to, uh, you know, we're all very busy we were very busy at that time. And so we tried to make the meetings as much as we can. Um, and then basically at the end of the year, we do a, like a finding series is what it's called. And and with that, um, we present whatever, it's a work in progress presentation. There's absolutely no pressure. It's really, it's, it's just so process based. And to have that, especially in New York City, especially at that time was just so, such a, such a respite, you know, mm-hmm. um, and, what happened with my year was COVID hit um, and then we weren't able to have our finding series happen in person. So we quickly had to shift to, we had to adapt, right? <laughs> we had to problem solve. Right, and, right. and so we did. Um, and it was my first time directing something virtually. Um, and I learned a lot, but the civilians, I will say like Matt and I's project was the first one to go in the series. So <laughs> um, I would like to say we were like the biggest guinea pig Um out of the lot, Um, but we had so much support. I mean, Alana Becker, she also um, took over being the, um, she joined the group as our director. Um, Megan moved on to to another position at second stage during our year. So, you know, it was just a year of, um, there was a lot of transition globally, internally, Um, but I, you know, I I didn't mind it because I I like, for me, it's like the more people I can get to know, the better um, and, and I felt so so, so supported by this community, um, and it was it was lovely. We we did a virtual presentation, and we had um, there was an element of community that I felt that was very present that isn't always present in the virtual um, performances that I get to direct or engage with, um, where we had you know a, a live introduction at the top, and then um, a live sort of talk back, you know, celebration of the cast, which was so lovely. Um, but yeah. I, did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah, that was perfect. No, I was just I I had I had celebrated when I had seen you uh, come up with the in in the press release about the R and D group for this year because mm-hmm. I it, it it seemed like such a uh, it seemed like such a perfect hop to go from literally being uh, to being at one of the juggernauts, one of the very few crossover companies that has off-Broadway houses and, and a Broadway house and, and works inside of the not-for-profit model and both to go to a, a significantly smaller budgeted but just um, similarly well-respected and and sort of deeply impactive company. Um, but I do want to talk about Roundabout because I think a lot of people may not know that there are 
these that there are uh, fellowships at at the large not for profits and and it occurred to me um, when I was doing some background for our interview that it, it was really such a rare and beautiful opportunity that I think a lot of career directors never necessarily get where you got to be inside of one sort of company's embrace for the calendar year, but you were working, uh, you were doing, working on Shepard for, on Broadway, and you were uh, in the roundabout downstairs working on a show with Margo, I think. Like, it seemed like, yeah. it seemed like your programming was taking you all over their operation, and it, it seemed like a very keen way to learn the ins and outs of their, everything from their black box to their Broadway house. What was your, what was sort of your experience? I mean, sort of taking it from the, the first day, the first day on the job, working in those different spaces, what, what was that like for you? Yeah, so for that, um, that fellowship, I was, it was, it was another like moment of transition, right? Because mm -hmm. before that, um, I was a directing apprentice at McCarter Theater, which is a, a large regional theater in Princeton, New Jersey. A great one, too. Um, like, just fantastic. Yeah. Company too. yeah. No, I, I, I will say that I, I've tried to be very intentional with um, trying to learn the ins and outs of different theaters and, or, um, yeah, different theaters at different levels. And, and I'm really fascinated by process. Um, yes, intentionally constructed. Yeah, that was well said by Rachel. Um, I just, I love, I love that. I love the circuitousness of that. That makes me happy. <laughs> um, yeah. So where was I? Um, anyway, so I've, I've just tried to be really intentional to, um, which theaters I try to engage with. And, um, really for me, I'm so, I'm so fascinated by process and I've, I've been really fortunate, fortunate in my time in New York, um, to, be able to be on the like be really deeply involved in the creative processes in some rooms and then also like the fly in the wall mm -hmm. um so with roundabout um that was a very big step for me because i went from being a directing apprentice at mccarter where i was very immersed in the culture there and i you know i worked administratively in the artistic office but then also was in the rehearsal room so it was like a great um step in my career but roundabout was really the first step that I took in being like really planting my feet as like an artist on my own. Mm -hmm. um, roundabout with that with the directing fellowship, they really treat you like an artist in residence for the for the calendar year, and that was major for me because while at McCarter, yes, I did get to learn a lot, and it it, it still had a more much more of like an educational component. And roundabout was like, we trust you, like we we're here because we believe in you as like a fully vetted artist, and that was just like incredible. Um, especially like for me, I like to give a little background about me. Like I'm, my parents are from Cuba. I'm a first generation, uh, you know, college student and American um, to the United States. Um, and so to be in an institution that large was just like a really big milestone for my community, for the Central Florida community, and also um, for like the Latinx community, I would say, and then also for like my family, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, I, I, I definitely learned a lot being there and the fellowship, all the things you mentioned, like that is intentionally um, designed in the fellowship because the goal is that you are able to assist on an underground show, which the underground is their new works development space. It's their black box. Um, and so that's where like a lot of um, up emerging playwrights get to have their first big um, New York debut. And, and that's a really exciting space for me in particular, and then also working at their larger off-Broadway space. And then um, I did get my first Broadway credit through them working on True West, which was um, such an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. um, and then on top of that, I did get to direct to um, stage readings of my choosing. And that's how Ryan and I met. Um, yeah, I, I was thinking before I jumped on, I was like, how did Ryan and I like, I don't know who told me to talk to you. <laughs> but was, I, I think it was, was, it Beth, was it Beth Lake? No, but, oh, someone, okay, yeah, actually, okay, someone who worked on True West, who was this associate sound designer, recommended you, so, um, I right. know, I know, we're I, The, the, uh, it really, the, the, to trace the journeys, to trace the journeys that bring us all together, I'd love to go back after I've done this show for, like, two or three months and try to figure out where everybody came from in my life, because, like, like you're saying, like, it, it, there's a moment where suddenly, I think this is a very, it's a very New York thing where suddenly so many people are in your life and you can't remember how they got there, but now they're there and they're contributing, which is really great. Yeah. Um, and the other thing too, is I just, I feel like, um, I feel like it's, it's wonderful. The, you know, recommending, recommending people that you trust to other people that you trust is like one of, I think the greatest artistic gifts that you can give, especially, you know, in New York, but literally anywhere that you're making 
uh, performance art or any any type of fine art, is it's that idea that um, uh, even if you aren't going to be the one to benefit from it, it's like the fact that you and I now know each other may get the person that recommended me a job in another four years. And it's it's, it's that idea that you're constantly you're 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 bouncing racquetballs. You're not just throwing a baseball that you're never going to see again. You're bouncing racquetballs, and it's all going to come back to you in strange ways, yeah. um, which is it's what makes. It's like for the greater good, right? Like that's how I think about it. And for me, it's um, community building is such at a core, um, like it's at the core of what I do as an artist. And um, as a director, I feel like, you know, <laughs> I, I'm i trying to think of a better phrase, but mm -hmm. for me, it's like if my superpower could be anything, it would be bringing people together, you know, like, like what Rachel said, you know, it's like we have, um, that isn't always the case for emerging directors, but when you do reach a certain level, you do have a lot of say in the people that you you um, you build these these rooms with, right? And that you tell these stories with. Um, and that's like another exciting thing about new work development because there's so much, um, I think, freedom and potential and then also like reckoning we have to do. And for me, like being at Roundabout, an institution that is known for being predominantly white and has had its history. Um, mm -hmm. I was there at a time where they were, um, really with the fellowship specifically really interested in, in trying to um, move forward and, and do that with intention. So um, yeah, I'm, 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 for me, I'm really interested in like consciously creating the canon and contributing to it um, and, and really trying to um, hold space for the stories that, that haven't always been given that opportunity. Um, whether I direct it or whether, you know, I'm the dramaturg or, mm -hmm. you know, just a spectator. Honestly, I think there is such a level of, um, I, I think, it, like, I, I went to the National Black Theater for my first show in New York ever. And I was just like so moved by their model of, of, of being. And, and that's something that I always think about when, when I engage in spaces. That was my, that was my first theater in New York too, uh, was wow. MBT. And it's just, I think it's set, it's set a really high bar that, I set a really high bar that a lot of companies that I've since worked with that I would I had I had hoped would exceed it have have not. It, it set a very high bar that hasn't been matched in a lot of in a lot of cases, and and um, I actually haven't checked in with them this year to see what's going on. I I know I know that there was some, there was some venue things and they're a tremendous tremendous group of artists doing yeah. things for the right reasons. I want I want to point out I don't know if it's a phrase you've used before, but if you didn't consciously creating the canon. Yeah. One of my new favorite things. My last question for you, kind of in that vein, is um, is there someone that you are uh, either an emerging playwright or someone from the existing canon that you that you're yearning, itching to either recreate or promote? Is there someone that you in, in, a, in a blue sky world where we're out of this thing and we're putting work back up and someone gives you a hundred and hundred million dollars and a theater? Who's who do you want to put up? Who's someone that you just can't wait to um to produce and direct once you've once we're clear of this <laughs> that is a great question but as you're asking i'm like man i know so many playwrights sure 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 sure. Uh, and yeah i'm not and this is not the this is not the number one as, as yeah, far as is there, yeah. is there some is there is there someone that because we'll be here all night and listen mary yeah. chifo's still in the green room so goodness knows like if she comes back on the three of us are talking we're going to be here till till 10 p.m yeah. so but if you have any in particular that's great and if not um uh if not, that's fine too. I I promise no no trick questions on this show. Yeah, yeah, of course, and I trust you. Um, I mean, I will say like a few that just came to my mind, right? Like these are brilliant Latinx playwrights. I, I think that's really the community that I tried to really um, engage with. So for me, it's like Guadalupe Gunman, um, Rendara Santiago, yes, uh, Eliana Pipe. Who, who's who I hope Ren's going to be on the show in a couple of weeks because that's going to make me so happy. Okay, I'm sorry, please yeah. continue. So these are all, you know, like Latinx um, women, yeah, Latinas, and they're just like amazing. And they're people that two of them who had uh, productions canceled due to COVID um, were affected by that. Um, and so I, those are the three people that, that I adore. And um, there's so many more. I mean, <laughs> for me, it, it, I, I love like, just building relationships with writers and I'm, I, I want to help 
champion them. So um, this is just me on the spot. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to think I about it an hour later and be like, oh, I didn't see this person. Oh, I didn't see this person. <laughs> oh, trust me. I, I literally I literally walk away from this show every week and I spend three hours thinking about the things I meant to ask. Like it's trust me, it's that it's that I it's it's the danger of I, I don't want to turn it into a, an actual like prescribed someone actually someone actually asked for my questions ahead of time yesterday and it made me think I'm like that's not that's not the show I set out to make but like that's a that's a very that's a very specific type of show that that leverages both for the host and the guest something different but in the conversational style I am so grateful to have you on and for you to be so open and willing to just chat with me and throw you on the spot like that um what is the are you in you are you in New York I'm trying to figure out are are you here are you not here are you going to be back here in the next little bit or <laughs> Now that that's like <laughs> I don't I I um I don't know you don't know okay um, yeah you know um but I have been back in Florida for a little bit of time great just, like, reconnecting with my family and then also reconnecting with the Florida theater scene which is something um I haven't really I haven't done in a few years so it's it's been quite lovely I'm actually doing something virtual um with Mad Cow Theater um which is not too you know not too far away from you know southeastern uh southeastern theaters. Mm -hmm. um so yeah you know i'm just i'm just um taking it day by day honestly i if i'm being really honest with you i'm taking it one step at a time well the, re and the reason i ask is is new york's new york's temporary loss might be this our gain because when you are at mad cow you are exactly a three-hour drive from savannah because i was once i was once running late to a curtain at mad cow and i know that if you drive safely and don't get arrested for you will be there in exactly three hours. So that uh, we, mm -hmm. I hope, I hope at some point when I get down and you're, and if you're still there, we'll we'll get you up and and have have an opportunity to work with you before you head back to the city. But in the meantime, Kathleen, thank you for being on and thanks for your candor. So happy to have you, and wishing you the best for everything that's coming up. Yeah, thank you so much. You've been an excellent host. Thank you, and we'll talk to you soon. That was Kathleen Captasooner, a director uh, formerly of Roundabout, currently of The Civilians, and making very deliberate and wonderful career choices. Um, pretty much that's the show. We have, we have, we have a sign-off on this show, and the sign-off is, uh, till next time, great stories, great theater. I wonder if Mary Chifa would come back on and say, till next time, great stories, great theater with me. Thumbs up, Mary. Is that a, is that a yes? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Mary Chifo and I are now going to say, what did I just say it was? Till next time, great stories, great theater. And you're muted. That's not going to be good. Wait, I think you've, are you there? Are you there? No, I will do, I will do like the singing in the rain thing. Right. Yes. Ready? Oh, yes. I'm going to turn, I'm going to, I'm going to make you full. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm going to say it and you're going to mouth it. Ready? Here we go. Till next time, great stories, great theater. The ghost light, a single bulb left center stage after each performance, has traditionally served as a supernatural offering to those who came before us and those we have lost, to ensure that the theater, their theater, never goes dark. That the magic of theater continues. Theaters from Broadway to the West End, Los Angeles to Savannah may be closed for now, but their ghost lights remain lit. Our spirits remain hungry, our responsibilities clear. We look at this as an opportunity, a chance to build on the work we've done. A chance to embrace our theatrical roots and create new adventures. What we do now paves the way for the years to come, for the Savannah rep of the future. We promise that the ghost light will burn brightly until it is safe to begin again. It is our responsibility to carry on the traditions that precede us. We are Savannah rep. A home for great stories and great theater. The hands of the clock will move again. And this is not the end of the story. It's a new beginning. 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 And we'll see you soon. <laughs>